Chapter Two of the Mastery of Destiny. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. The Mastery of Destiny by James Allen. Chapter Two. The Science of Self Control. We live in a scientific age. Men of science are numbered by thousands, and they are ceaselessly searching, analyzing, and experimenting with a view to discovery and the increase of knowledge. The shelves of our libraries, both public and private, are heavy with their load of imposing volumes on scientific subjects, and the wonderful achievements of modern science are always before us, whether in our homes or in our streets, in country or town, on land or sea. There shall we have before us some marvelous device, some recent accomplishment of science, for adding to our comfort, increasing our speed, or saving the labor of our hands. Yet with all our vast store of scientific knowledge, and its startling and rapidly increasing results in the world of discovery and invention, there is, in this age, one branch of science which has so far fallen into decay as to have become almost forgotten, a science, nevertheless, which is of greater importance than all the other sciences combined, and without which all science would but subserve the ends of selfishness and aid in man's destruction. I refer to the science of self-control. Our modern scientists study the elements and forces which are outside themselves, with the object of controlling and utilizing them. The ancients studied the elements and forces which were within themselves, with a view to controlling and utilizing them, and the ancients produced such mighty masters of knowledge in this direction, that to this day they are held in reverence as gods, and the vast religious organizations of the world are based upon their achievements. Wonderful as are the forces in nature, they are vastly inferior to that combination of intelligent forces which comprise the mind of man, and which dominate and direct the blind mechanical forces of nature. Therefore, it follows that, to understand, control, and direct the inner forces of passion, desire, will, and intellect, is to be in possession of the destinies of men and nations. As in ordinary science, there are, in this divine science, degrees of attainment, and a man is great in knowledge, great in himself, and great in his influence on the world, in the measure that he is great in self-control. He who understands and dominates the forces of external nature is the natural scientist, but he who understands and dominates the internal forces of the mind is the divine scientist, and the laws which operate in gaining a knowledge of external appearances operate also in gathering a knowledge of internal varieties. A man cannot become an accomplished scientist in a few weeks or months, nay, not even in a few years, but only after many years of painstaking investigation can he speak with authority, and be ranked among the masters of science. Likewise, a man cannot acquire self-control and become possessed of the wisdom and peace-giving knowledge which self-control confers, but by many years of patient labor, a labor which is all the more arduous because it is silent and both unrecognized and unappreciated by others. And he who would pursue this science successfully must learn to stand alone, and to toll unrewarded, as far as any outward emolument is concerned. The natural scientist pursues, in acquiring his particular kind of knowledge, the following five orderly and sequential steps. 1. Observation. That is, he closely and persistently observes the facts of nature. 2. Experiment. Having become acquainted, by repeated observations, with certain facts, 
he experiments with those facts, with a view to the discovery of natural law. He puts his facts through rigid processes of analysis, and so finds out what is useless and what of value, and he rejects the former and retains the latter. 3. Classification. Having accumulated and verified a mass of facts by numberless observations and experiments, he commences to classify those facts, to arrange them in orderly groups, with the object of discovering some underlying law, some hidden and unifying principle, which governs, regulates, and binds together these facts. 4. Deduction. Thus he passes on to the fourth step of deduction. From the facts and results which are before him, he discovers certain invariable modes of action, and thus reveals the hidden law of things. 5. Knowledge. Having proven and established certain laws, it may be said of such a man that he knows. He is a scientist, a man of knowledge. But the attainment of scientific knowledge is not the end, great as it is. Men do not attain knowledge for themselves alone, nor to keep it locked secretly in their hearts, like a beautiful jewel in a dark chest. The end of such knowledge is use, service, the increase of the comfort and happiness of the world. Thus, when a man has become a scientist, he gives the world the benefit of his knowledge, and unselfishly bestows upon mankind the results of all his labors. Thus beyond knowledge there is a further step of use, that is, the right and unselfish use of the knowledge acquired, the application of knowledge to invention for the common weal. It will be noted that the five steps or processes enumerated follow in orderly succession, and that no man can become a scientist who omits any one of them. Without the first step of systematic observation, for instance, he could not even enter the realm of knowledge of nature's secrets. At first, the searcher for such knowledge has before him a universe of things, these things he does not understand. Many of them, indeed, seem to be irreconcilably opposed one to the other, and there is apparent confusion, but by patiently and laboriously pursuing these five processes, he discovers the order, nature, and essence of things, perceives the central law or laws which bind them together in harmonious relationship and so puts an end to confusion and ignorance. As with the natural scientist, so with the divine scientist, he must pursue, with the same self-sacrificing diligence, five progressive steps in the attainment of self-knowledge, self-control. These five steps are the same as with the natural scientist, but the process is reversed. The mind, instead of being centered upon external things, is turned back upon itself, and the investigations are pursued in the realm of the mind, or of one's own mind, instead of in that of matter. At first, the searcher for divine knowledge is confronted with that mass of desires, passions, emotions, ideas, and intellections, which he calls himself, which is the basis of all his actions, and from which his life proceeds. This combination of invisible yet powerful forces appears confusedly. Some of them stand, apparently, in direct conflict with each other, without any appearance or hope of reconciliation. His mind in its entirety, too, with his life which proceeds from that mind, does not seem to have any equitable relation to many other minds and lives about him. And altogether, there is a condition of pain and confusion from which he would fain escape. Thus he begins by keenly realizing his state of ignorance. For no one could acquire either natural or divine knowledge if he were convinced that without study or labor he already possessed it. With such perception of one's ignorance, there comes the desire for knowledge, and the novice in self-control 
enters upon the ascending pathway, in which are the following five steps. 1. Introspection This coincides with the observation of the natural scientist. The mental eye is turned like a searchlight upon the inner things of the mind, and its subtle and ever-varying processes are observed and carefully noted. This stepping aside from selfish gratifications, from the excitements of worldly pleasures and ambitions, in order to observe, with the object of understanding, one's nature, is the beginning of self-control. Hitherto, the man has been blindly and impotently borne along by the impulses of his nature, the mere creature of things and circumstances, but now he puts a check upon his impulses, and instead of being controlled, begins to control. 2. Self-analysis. Having observed the tendencies of the mind, they are then closely examined, and are put through a rigid process of analysis. The evil tendencies, those that produce painful effects, are separated from the good tendencies, those that produce peaceful effects, and the various tendencies, with the particular actions they produce, and the definite results which invariably spring from these actions, are gradually grasped by the understanding, which is at last enabled to follow them in their swift and subtle interplay and profound ramifications. It is a process of testing and proving, and for the searcher, a period of being tested and proved. 3. Adjustment By this time, the practical student of things divine has clearly before him every tendency and aspect of his nature, down to the profoundest promptings of his mind, and the most subtle motives of his heart. There is not a spot or corner left which he has not explored and illuminated with the light of self-examination. He is familiar with every weak and selfish point, every strong and virtuous quality. It is considered the height of wisdom to be able to see ourselves as others see us. But the practitioner of self-control goes far beyond this. He not only sees himself as others see him, he sees himself as he is. Thus standing face to face with himself, not striving to hide away from any secret fault, no longer defending himself with pleasant flatteries, neither underrating nor overrating himself or his powers, and no more cursed with self-praise or self-pity, he sees the full magnitude of the task which lies before him, sees dearly ahead the heights of self-control, and knows what work he has to do to reach them. He is no longer in a state of confusion, but has gained a glimpse of the laws which operate in the world of thought, and he now begins to adjust his mind in accordance with those laws. This is a process of weeding, sifting, cleansing. As the farmer weeds, cleans, and prepares the ground for his crops, so the student removes the weeds of evil from his mind, cleanses and purifies it, preparatory to sowing the seeds of righteous actions, which shall produce the harvest of a well-ordered life. 4. Righteousness Having adjusted his thoughts and deeds to those minor laws which operate in mental activities in the production of pain and pleasure, unrest and peace, sorrow and bliss, he now perceives that there is involved in those laws one great central law, which like the law of gravitation in the natural world, is supreme in the world of mind, a law to which all thoughts and deeds are subservient, and by which they are regulated and kept in their proper sphere. There is the law of justice or righteousness, which is universal and supreme. To this law he now conforms. Instead of thinking and acting blindly, as the nature is stimulated and appealed to by outward things, he subordinates his thoughts and deeds to this central principle. He no longer acts from self, but does what is right, what is universally and eternally right. He is no longer the abject slave of his nature and circumstances. 
he is the master of his nature and circumstances. He is no longer carried hither and thither on the forces of his mind. He controls and guides those forces to the accomplishment of his purposes. Thus having his nature in control and subjugation, not thinking thoughts, nor doing deeds which oppose the righteous law, and which, therefore, that law annuls with suffering and defeat, he rises above the dominion of sin and sorrow, ignorance and doubt, and is strong, calm, and peaceful. 5. Pure Knowledge By thinking right and acting right, he proves, by experience, the existence of the divine law on which the mind is framed, and which is the guiding and unifying principle in all human affairs and events, whether individual or national. Thus by perfecting himself in self-control, he acquires divine knowledge. He reaches the point where it may be said of him, as of the natural scientist, that he knows. He has mastered the science of self-control, and has brought knowledge out of ignorance, order out of confusion. He has acquired that knowledge of self, which includes knowledge of all men, that knowledge of one's own life, which embraces knowledge of all lives, as for all minds are the same in essence, differing only in degree, are framed upon the same law, and the same thoughts and acts, by whatsoever individual they are wrought, will always produce the same results. But this divine and peace-bestowing knowledge, as in the case of the natural scientist, is not gained for one's own self alone. For if this were so, the aim of evolution would be frustrated, and it is not in the nature of things to fall short of ripening and accomplishment. And indeed, he who thought to gain this knowledge solely for his own happiness would most surely fail. So beyond the fifth step of pure knowledge, there is still a further one of wisdom, which is the right application of the knowledge acquired, the pouring out upon the world, unselfishly and without stint, the results of one's labors, 